After I was ordained to the priest, I was assigned to the cathedral in Allentown, where I spent three years there. And there was a young girl there. By, she was around when I first met her, maybe around 13, 14 years old. And she was blind. In fact, I found out that she was blind one day when I went to go shake her hand, and she just stood there. And I said to myself, you know, what? What's with these kids? You know, they, they don't have any manners. And then I finally figured out that she was blind. Uh, just one of many of my knucklehead stories that I'll put in a book for you one day. Uh, but besides all that, she was a very gifted student. Uh, in high school, she was the valedictorian of her class. And then she went to the University of Notre Dame, where she also graduated with the highest honors and I believe is pursuing, if not already retained, a doctorate degree. You know, it's amazing how God's glory shines and how his gifts are so, so noticeable in her life. What we would consider limitations to God, they're not. Very gifted student, but also a young woman of faith. You know, today's gospel passage of the man born blind begins, we didn't hear it, I read the shorter version for you uh, again today. But it begins with Jesus and the disciples walking by this blind man who is also a beggar. And the disciples asked Jesus a question. Was it because he was a sinner? Or was it because his parents were sinners that he was born blind? That was the question, A or B. Was it him? Or was it the parents that were sinners? For the reason why he was born blind. And Jesus says, the answer is C, none of the above. But it's for the glory of God that this man has been born blind. For this moment right here, this is the reason why he was born blind. For this very moment right here as Jesus meets him, ready to give him his eyesight back. And so that's what he does. Jesus does something very disgusting. He He spits on the ground so that his saliva on the ground, which is the dust, forms a clay mixture, making an allusion back to Genesis where God formed Adam out of the clay of the ground, that the Jews actually believed that God spit on the ground to form the clay and then to form Adam from that. So what we have here is an act of recreation. We have God in the presence of Jesus Christ recreating the human person again with this clay mixture. And so then he takes his clay mixture, he puts it on his eyes, and then he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And then out of the waters, out of the washing, we have a new creation, a new, a new human who is now able to see this time. And you think that when the man gets his sight back, when, when the people witness this act of recreation right in front of them, that, that everyone would come to believe in Jesus But as we continue through the story, has the the, the man's neighbors and those who know him are brought into a discussion and like, wait a second, is this this the guy that was born blind? He can see now. Which then the man says, yeah, yeah, no, I'm him. Yeah, it's me. And then they take him to the Pharisees and all the things, the only thing the Pharisees can, can just think about is, well, no, this can't happen because it was done on a Sabbath. Just a very disordered view of the Sabbath in their minds of what it was supposed to be. But then they get into this discussion and, and the testimony of the neighbors and the friends that they, they don't believe that. And then again, we don't we don't we didn't hear it this morning, but in the longer version, they actually go to the man's parents and say, Hey, is this your son, the one who was born blind? And, and they say, Well, yeah, it's it's him. And they ask him more questions, but the parents then are like you know what, don't talk to us. Talk, talk to him. We don't want anything to do with this. They were afraid. And then they go back to the man and they ask the man some more questions and say, well, you know, you were born in the sinner and we're, we're disciples of Moses and all this stuff. The story ends with them throwing him out of the temple, which means what? They're throwing him out of worship. He's not allowed to worship anymore. He's not part of the community. 
And all he did was get his eyesight back. John, I mean, not only is John a great theological masterpiece here, this gospel, this gospel is a great work of literature. John must have been a gifted man himself, obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit. But I really believe that he presents us this question as we read this story. Who, in fact, is really blind in this story? It wasn't the man born blind. He wasn't blind. It was the Pharisees. Because they can't see God right there in front of them. (laughs) The fact that the man gets his eyes back, they can't see, they're blind to it, and they end up throwing him out. Because they have a vested interest in remaining in their blindness. Right? If, if they acknowledge Jesus as, a, as the one true God, things have to change in their lives too. It's better just to be blind. But before we, we point the finger at them, before we say, oh, how could they? Yeah, I would never act like that. I would say both you and I, we have a lot of spiritual blindness in our lives. A lot of things that we don't want to see. We don't want to see because it's scary. We don't want to see because it makes it forces change upon our lives. We don't want to see because we just don't want to deal with it. But we have blindness. Oh, yeah, we do. Blindness, first and foremost, to not only just sin, but to the effects of sin of what it actually does to us. But blindness also to God's mercy. Because I think some of us are so weighed down by our conscience We can't see the love and mercy of God. So for some of us, the blindness is like what sin actually does to us. We we don't want to acknowledge it because then we have to change. But some of us are blind to the mercy of God because we just can't believe that someone would love us like this. We're blind to the fact that we can't see ourselves as God's beloved sons and daughters because maybe, again, maybe because we're so hung up of, of what our past lives were. But there's many, many different things in which we are spiritually blind to. But the tough part is, is that the fact that we're blind to it, we can't really identify what it is, right? If I were to ask you, oh, what is spiritual blindness in your lives? Like, what a stupid question to ask, right? You know, well, we don't know what it is. We're, we're blind. We can't see it. So this is where two things come into play here. First and foremost, when I say prayer, I mean a type of prayer that allows silence and meditation. Meditation upon the word, meditation maybe upon the prayers that we're actually praying, whether it's the rosary or the Our Father, whatever it is. But to allow ourselves time of silence, because in the silence is when God speaks to us, and then God starts to give ourselves sight on the things that we don't want to see in our lives. Again, Beware, caution if you want to proceed because it sometimes can be scary. We don't like what God wants to tell us. But another more practical way is also good friendships in our life. For maybe some of you, it's maybe it's your spouse who's able to, to point out everything that you can't see in your life, you know, and it's nagging at you. But maybe not everyone's married. Someone in your life who can be brutally honest with you because we're not always the best case of judging ourselves. You know, we're not always the best at it. Sometimes we just need that one someone in our lives who we can trust, who can be honest with us and very direct with us. And then to accept their words of wisdom and to accept their words because we don't always see it in our lives. But in all this, as I said, the story ends with the man who has regained his eyesight. He can now see he's a new man now. And he's thrown out of the temple, thrown out of worship. But what does he do at the end? When Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah, the one who is speaking to him, the one who he has seen, what does he do? He falls down and he worships. So now his object of worship is no longer in a temple, but it's in a person. For us, in our worship, 
and our giving of ourselves over to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we also muster up the courage to allow him to give us our eyesight and to see the things in our lives that we can't see. May God bless you.